During the ADA symposium, Dr. Nock discussed the Incretin effect and what is currently known about the mechanism of action of dual GLP-1 and GIP agonists. Dr. D'Alessio delivered a similar presentation during the ENDO symposium. His presentation is available as a resource on the activity website. Yeah, thank you and welcome to the section on incretins and the therapeutic potential that comes from physiology of the GI tract secreting these gut hormones. So the first slide I'm going to show you is showing you how we measure the incretin effect. So this is a healthy subject or a group of healthy subjects receiving an oral glucose load. And on a second day, we infuse glucose to match exactly that curve. And this is what happens after oral glucose in terms of insulin levels. And this is what happens with intravenous glucose. So it's not the glucose alone, because that is not different between the two conditions. It is the gut hormones. So if you infuse glucose intravenously, nothing happens. But if you make them drink a glucose drink, then GIP levels go up several fold, and GLP-1 concentrations do it with a similar pattern, albeit on a lower level. So this difference in insulin secretion, and this is C-peptide to prove that it's really a difference in secretion, determines the, uh, the role of, of gut hormones. Uh, without gut hormones, we would have had just this insulin secretion and certainly a much higher rise in glucose. This proves the physiological importance of incretins. So how is this in patients with type 2 diabetes? This is just showing healthy subjects again. And here are the type 2 patients. Of course, they have higher glucose levels. They have their typical slow, uh, be slowly beginning uh, rise in insulin secretion. Uh, and they have a much reduced incretin effect when you measure insulin and when we measured C-peptide to be sure that we are catching insulin secretory activity, there was no significant difference at any time point. So there is something at defect in patients with type 2 diabetes regarding the incretin effect. And as, as I said when I talked to the previous slide, if you do not have the incretin uh, related response in insulin secretion that will certainly damage your glucose tolerance. So we had to find out what is the reason. And this is a very simple experiment. In gray, you see patients uh, receiving a placebo infusion. In blue, you see patients receiving a GIP infusion. In red, you've, uh, in green, you see GLP-1 infusion. And in red, you see the combination. So basically, these are fasting patients, high plasma glucose to begin with, and they were followed for six hours. And if you give them GLP-1, they have a normal glucose at the end of the six-hour period. If you give them GIP, you have a slightly reduced glucose curve versus placebo, but that was not significant. And if you now look for insulin, C-peptide, and insulin secretion rates, you can see that there was not much stimulation, certainly not a significant one, with GIP infusions, but there was a good response with GLP-1. However, if you combined GIP and GLP-1, that didn't change versus GLP-1 alone. And what we conclude from this is that the patients with type 2 diabetes do not respond to GIP the way that healthy subjects would respond to GIP, and that this is the major explanation for the reduced incretin effect in these subjects. So the reduced incretin effect indicates an inability of GIP to stimulate insulin secretion in patients with type 2 diabetes. The second aspect I want to talk about is the role of GLP-1 and GIP in reducing body weight. And the old way of looking at this, based on experience with GIP receptor knockout mice, was that if you don't have a GIP receptor, you can overfeed mice and they will not get fat. 
that indicates the functioning GIP receptor helps you get obese. And then there are some physiological facts. One uh, of them is that GIP increases insulin release, and insulin also is an anabolic hormone and will promote the storage of fat. So the old view really was GIP helps you getting uh, obese. And now we have new findings, and they indicate GIP receptor stimulation in contrast to what we believed earlier may have a chance to reduce your food intake, which will in the long run lead to weight loss. And the data that help us uh, look at it this way show that in the hypothalamus, ARC is arcuate nucleus, this is probably the, the location where it's very important, they have uh, neurons expressing GLP-1 receptors, other neurons expressing GIP receptors, and even neurons that have both GLP-1 and GIP receptors. And it's similar in the dorsal medial hypothalamus. And in recently published results in uh, rodents, in mice, some of them have their GIP receptors, others have a knocked out GIP receptor, and when you inject into the brain, into the cerebrospinal fluid GIP, then the animals will eat less and lose body weight. If you have a receptor knockout, this doesn't work. But even if you inject the GIP into the periphery so that it's circulating in the circulation, they also reduce body weight. And of course, if there is no receptor, then this doesn't work. And some other results have indicated that maybe if uh, it depends on the dose you use, but in some experiments, there was rather little effect of GLP-1 and GIP alone, shown in uh, red and green. But in orange, the combination was very effective in inhibiting food intake. And it even led to weight loss within 24 hours uh, in the animals receiving that combination. So these are animal studies. But of course, this is of great interest. So our colleagues in Copenhagen have performed experiments in healthy subjects. And they reproduce, shown in red, that if you give an intravenous infusion of GLP-1, the uh, volunteers will report less hunger, more satiety, and they really consume less energy when you offer them an ad libitum meal. That's the red symbols versus the black symbols showing placebo. Uh, in, in violet, you see GIP infusions. They seem to do a little, but that was not significant. And then came the surprise that if you co-administer GIP and GLP-1, then suddenly the reduction in food intake that was observed with GLP-1 alone was reduced. So that was exactly not what the animal experiments had shown. And that is our uh, state of the art today. And uh, we will probably uh, have an explanation a couple of years from now. But what this tells us is that under certain circumstances, you can have more effects when you combine uh, agonism at, let's say, the GIP and the GLP-1 receptor. And this combination is uh, particularly attractive because we are talking about the two incretin hormones that have been characterized through the incretin effect that I showed you in the beginning. And uh, the experience says that after bariatric surgery, which really reduces body weight very much and leads to diabetes remission in two-thirds of the patients originally having type 2 diabetes. You have a, an exaggerated GLP-1 response, a somewhat elevated GIP response. There are other hormonal changes that I'm not going into for time reasons. And as far as we can tell, GLP-1 has the role of reducing appetite, food intake, energy intake, and body weight. 
uh, with GIP, we have these uh, uh, divergent observations from animal experiments and human experiments. Uh, and we all know that the effect on plasma glucose uh, of GLP-1 is very profound. This is proven by the existence of the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And uh, in some uh, subjects, GIP can do very much the same thing. So how do they interact? And uh, this is a question that we ask because of the pattern of hormonal secretion after bariatric surgery, but it's also a physiological question. So what I show you now has been studied in healthy subjects. And we have available specific receptor antagonists so that we can block the effect of endogenously secreted GIP and GLP-1. And I'll walk you through that slide. If you use these antagonists, there is the potential that the glucose excursion will rise because these are insulinotropic hormones. And if you take away some of the insulin secretion, then the consequence is a higher glucose excursion. Extended 9 to 39 in the right-hand panel shown in orange is an antagonist for GLP-1. And you see that insulin secretion is not significantly changed when you interfere with the signaling of GLP-1. However, in green, when you use the GIP receptor antagonist, then you have quite a reduction in insulin secretion. And if you use both at the same time, shown in dark blue, then you have a profound reduction in insulin secretion. And basically what these results tell us is that both GLP-1 and GIP are involved in mediating increased insulin secretion after an oral glucose stimulus, but that GIP is much more important as compared to GLP-1. In type 2 diabetes, as I showed you previously, there is a reduced insulinotropic response to the exposure to GIP. But again, our colleagues from Copenhagen, they have treated a group of type 2 diabetic patients with intensified insulin regimens just for uh, four weeks. And then they tested how they respond to GIP and GLP-1 after that period. And as you can see in blue, after intensified insulin treatment, they have an improved response in terms of C-peptide secretion. But this does not come close to what you see in healthy subjects. So there still is a reduced responsiveness to GIP, again, when you look at short-term exposure. But these kind of data have suggested that maybe it is better to address both GIP receptors and GLP-1 receptors. And the molecule that we are talking about today has a relatively complicated structure, and it's shown down here. And it's so colorful because some amino acids have been taken from GLP-1, which is shown up here. Some have been taken from GIP, shown in blue. And then there are also common amino acids for both GLP-1 and GIP. And then you see some yellow amino acids and aminobutyric acid uh, that have been used for some other reasons. But the result now is a hybrid molecule called terzapatide, and it is known from in vitro results that it has the excellent affinity to the GIP receptor, and it also binds and activates the GLP-1 receptor. So now we have a tool to see how the combined stimulation of GIP and GLP-1 uh, uh, receptors performs. And of course, the main interest is in type 2 diabetes or in obesity. <laughs> 